say a few words about the person on which you're going to have relation.
which you always used to inquire about my program in Eurogynecology. I still remember her words which she spoke to me. And it is a great privilege to talk in Dr. Padma Chandra Shekhar Moration. And let me talk on urinary incontinence in female. in women depends upon the complex interplay between the anatomic and physiological properties of the lower urinary tract, which include bladder, urethra, sphincter, and pelvic floor. <coughs> and coming to the lower urinary tract dysfunction, it always it is due to the storage the symptoms and emptying symptoms. So the storage symptoms is usually the storage symptoms lead to frequency nocturia, urgency and early incontinence. The emptying symptoms result in hesitancy, straining to void, thin stream or incomplete emptying. So according to International Continence Society, the overactive bladder is defined as urgency with or without or the incontinence, usually with the frequency and the nocturia in the absence of any pathologic or metabolic conditions of the bladder. So what are the symptoms of overactive bladder? We can see the women running to the toilet every time. So frequent urination, the sudden urge to urinate, and involuntary loss of urine and nocturia, and these all symptoms significantly impact the quality of life. So what are the types of urinary incontinence? It may be a urge urinary incontinence, or stress urinary incontinence or mixed symptoms. So in all urinary incontinence, in all urinary incontinence, the urine loss is accompanied by urgency from abnormal bladder contractions. In all urinary incontinence, the pathology is always in the bladder. Whereas in stress urinary incontinence, there is a urine loss resulting from increased intra-abdominal pressure in the absence of the two cell pathology, and this is usually due to the loss of support in the urethra. And the mixed symptoms are the combination of stress and urge incontinence. So the stress urinary incontinence is due to increased intra-abdominal pressure. The uh, urge urinary incontinence is due to the abnormal reduce of contractions. And the urethral pressure, when there is a problem in urethral pressure, the stress urinary incontinence results. What is the spectrum of overactive bladder? So the overactive bladder, it may be a dry overactive bladder where there is only frequency and nocturia, or there is a urge urinary incontinence, which I have already told you, the daytime frequency, nighttime, and urgency, or there may be a mixed symptoms of stress and urge urinary incontinence. So what is the prevalence of overactive bladder by age and gender? If you if you take less than 25 years, the incidence is less compared to 45 to 50, 55 to 60, and above 65, there is a static increase in the overactive bladder. So the women are more affected than men, and the 9.3% uh, of the women are affected than men in incontinence. Usually the overactive bladder in India, it is underreported. What we are seeing now is only the tip of the iceberg, and increasing incidence in aging population because many of your, many of our women will not come out with the complaints of urge urinary incontinence unless it is very much bothersome, they are able to manage by themselves. So it is only the tip of the iceberg. So less than half of women with the LUPS reporting their health care provider. Why? Because they feel embarrassed and they, they think that there is a low expectation for therapy. And they, some, many women think that it is a normal part of aging, like menopause. As they reach menopause, the incontinence results, which is not so. And we are conducting, nowadays I am conducting most of awareness camp among the urinary incontinence in women in many small groups to say that it is not a normal part of aging. And because of the availability of the many observant fats in the market, they don't come out with the symptoms. 
So what is the distribution of the disease among the women seeking care for pelvic floor disorders? So in the pelvic floor disorders, the amount of the women taking care is, the, you can see the 50% of the women here between 30 to 40 years, there is all urinary incontinence and 82% is in stress urinary incontinence and only a smaller amount of women have pelvic organ collapse. So when you compare to 70 to 80 years, the retrosal instability is more common than the stress urinary incontinence and the pelvic organ collapse rate increases as age increases and there is a gradual increase in infant 6 feet deficiency compared to the age less than 40, 50 and 39 years. So what is the impact of the urinary incontinence on quality of life? Of course, there is a limitation or cessation of physical activities and they feel guilty or depressed and there is a loss of respect and dignity and there is a fear of being a bird and a lack of blood control and urine odor, apathy and denial and socially there will be a reduction in social interaction because of frequent urination they may hesitate in participating in the social interaction and they may alter the travel plans frequently and increase the risk of institutionalization for frail older persons. So domestic the requirement for specialized underwear and bedding and special precautions with clothing. Occupational hazards, they are usually absent from their work with a decreased productivity and avoidance of the sexual contact and intimacy is also less. So what is the prevalence of the overactive bladder? It is a wet and dry. So the dry overactive bladder is more common than the wet overactive bladder. Here you can see 63% of the persons report with the dry overactive bladder or 37% report with the wet overactive bladder. So how will you diagnose overactive bladder? Most cases of overactive bladder can be diagnosed based on the patient history, symptom assessment, physical examination and urine analysis. And initiation of non-invasive treatment does not require any extensive further workup. So what are the questions to consider when treating the women with urinary incontinence? Are you concerned about the bladder control? Do you have any uncontrollable botched urinate resulting in wetting accidents? Do you use pads to protect your cloths? So physical examination includes the palpation of abdomen for any mask, and the pelvis and perineum should be looked for atrophic vaginitis and vaginal examination should exclude the pelvic organ collapse, gynec malignancy, fistulas and the rectal tone should be assessed to exclude the neurological causes and the reflexes, the sensory and motor reflexes should also be examined. So physical examination, we have to rule out the possible causes of UTS like atrophic vaginitis, estrogen deficiency, pelvic floor dysfunction and pelvic organ collapse and potentially serious any other pathological conditions associated. So the laboratory tests include urine analysis including the culture and appropriate blood work which includes renal function test and ultrasound KEP and pelvis with post white residual urine is very important and cystoscopy is also important and urodynamic studies only in special cases not in all cases. So the laboratory test to rule out the possible causes of LUTS, diabetes mellitus, lower urinary tract, tumor or kidney stones and the potentially serious pathological conditions, they have to be referred to appropriate specialists. So how will you differentiate overactive bladder with urge incontinence from stress incontinence? So in overactive bladder and urge incontinence, you can see the pathology is in the bladder. The bladder muscle is the retrosol is experiencing the frequently involuntary contractions resulting in the urinary incontinence. Whereas in stress urinary incontinence, the, there is no pathology in the retrosol and without any genuine retrosol contraction because of the loss of support to the urethra, they are unable to remain completely shut and thereby resulting in the urinary incontinence. So what is the differential diagnosis of overactive bladder? stress urinary incontinence and mixed incontinence and here you can see the in overactive bladder urgency and frequency are present and le leaking during physical activity will not be present. The amount of urinary leakage with each episode is large in overactive bladder whereas it is a small in stress urinary incontinence and with mixed symptoms it is variable. 
The ability to reach the toilet in time following an urge to void is often no in overactive bladder, but it is always in stress urinary incontinence and it is variable in mixed symptoms. So the most important symptom, the frequency with urgency is more in overactive bladder and mixed symptoms, but it is absent in stress urinary incontinence. So the mixed incontinence is the most bothersome symptoms. And in this study you can see that 30 to 40 percent of the women with the stress urinary incontinence and the overactive bladder is wet and this more than 50 percent suffer from wet overactive bladder and stress urinary incontinence. So coming to the treatment for overactive bladder, it may be of course the treatment is very important because the women cannot concentrate on their work frequently wherever they go they will be looking for the toilet. Even in the airport they will be looking for the toilet. Even if they go for shopping, they look for the toilet. So we have to be very careful in treating the women with overactive bladder and it should be given more due importance. So what are the treatment modalities? They may be a behavioral therapy, medications, neuromodulation and surgery. So behavioral modi modification, once you rule out the possible causes of the overactive bladder and the pathology is excluded in the bladder, the behavioral modification should be taught to these <coughs> patients like time to voiding. The patient should go for voiding because most of the women in their working condition, they will pass urine at 6 a.m. in the home or 8 a.m. in the home and they will control the bladder and they used to urinate only after reaching the home thinking that most of the toilets in public places are not good. So this is most common problem in my study which I have come across the commonest cause and in the school going children and the adolescent girls and in colleges this is one of the most common so I insist that the time to voiding is most important and delayed voiding once once in two to three hours the patient should be educated to pause during once in two to three hours they should not wait till the urgency comes and rush into the toilet and they should be careful in diet like avoid of uh, caffeine. Caffeine is a bladder irritant and stimulant and caffeine and then beverages and pelvic flow exercise is very must because it supports the urethral support and even the uh, pelvic floor exercises should be started from the adolescent age not in the menopause age group. So all adolescent girls should be taught to do the pelvic floor exercise which is very important and many studies have proved that it plays an important role in preventing the pelvic organ prolapse and then stress urinary incontinence and urethral support is enhanced. So the pelvic floor exercise is very important and also please instead our Indian, uh, using the Indian toilet is also important which will help the pelvic floor muscles. So, and through the education and law, these all modifications can be done to treat the overactive bladder. So diet modifications, avoid food beverages irritating the bladder, coffee and caffeine. So you should, you should advise the patient to avoid coffee and caffeine and manage the fluid intake. Because many women don't drink water thinking that if they drink water suddenly they will develop the uh, urgency to pass urine. So you should educate that they should take at least 8 to 10 tumblers of water per day and stop evening fluids but they can stop the fluids after 8 pm and so they should be instructed to use the 8 to 10 tumblers of water before 8 pm. So stop evening fluids and avoid constipation. See I visited Vienna recently last week. So that if I ask for a coffee it will be a big jar. So the coffee, caffeine, beverages should be avoided especially it is very common in western countries. And so bladder training, this is to modify the bladder function. So the methods are bladder diary should be maintained. The voiding diary is an important diagnostic tool. So you should ask the patient to take the voiding diary which includes the amount of fluid intake and the output and the time interval should be monitored at least for three days which will help the physician to initialize the treatment that is called the voiding diary or bladder diary. Gradually increase the voiding interval and teach coping strategies <coughs> and then strengthen the pelvic floor muscles and improving the bladder stability. So the behavioral modification according to GIHR 2000, 
the behavior there are therapy alone cost of 57.5% reduction in incontinence and 88.5% reduction in incontinence when other methods are added with medical method alone 72.7% 84 reduction when medicines are added. So, conclusion, combining the drug and behavioral therapy instead to program produce an added benefit of the patient. So, combining pharmacological behavioral therapy provides improved outcomes according to the uh, Badu et al. study. So, what are the anti-muscarinic agents used for the treatment of overactive bladder? Anti-muscarinic agents are the mainstay for treating the overactive bladder and OAB symptoms are relieved by inhibition of involuntary bladder contractions and it increases the bladder capacity. Bladder always have the capacity to increase so we should instruct the patient along with the drug that they should expand, they should allow the bladder to expand for 2 to 3 hours. They should not go to the toilet as ever as and when they think that they have to pass urine, that attitude should be prevented. So they should have an increased bladder capacity and treatment can be limited by side effects like dry mouth, GA tract effects and CNS effect. So what, where are all the muscarinic receptors are distributed? They are distributed in the CNS, I'm sorry. So they are distributed in the CNS, so where they can cause the dizziness, somnolence, impaired memory and recognition. And in the iris, it can cause blurred vision and dry eyes, salivary glands, dry mouth. In the heart, it can cause the tachycardia, GA tract, it causes dyspepsia, colon constipation, and the bladder, it causes, it inhibits the contraction of the bladder. So, we have to see that the anticholinergic should maintain a delicate balance, that they should have a good efficacy, they like, they reduces the frequency or urinary incontinence and increases the void and volume with small lesser side effect like dry mouth and constipation. What are the anti-muscarinic agent agents that can be used for treating the overactive bladder? They are oxybutynin. There are so many drugs in the market. The order of the drugs are oxybutynin which can be an immediate and release and extended release. Oxybutynin transdermal daily patch is also available and probably other agents are tolgeridone, darifenacin, solifenacin, prospium and veraborgon. Veraborgon is not available in India but it is available in western countries. And so the, how is the, what is the distribution of the receptors in the bladder? You can see the all M2 and M3 receptors are more in the mucosa and submucosa. Alpha receptors are more in the bladder neck and urethra and the retrosal muscle contains 80% of the M2 and 20% of the M3 receptors. And so there are drugs which are only the bladder specific, retrosal specific drugs are available which are darifenacin and solifenacin with a lesser side effect. So oxybutynin they cause immediate and long acting form. Immediate, the dosage is a TID dosage and long acting once a day, either it can be a 5 or 10 milligram. The side effect include dry mouth, constipation and headache and it is also approved for pediatric use. And the patch is a 3.9 milligram patch twice weekly and similar effects to oral and the side effect are less dry mouth but erythema and chloride can occur. So told with those, the available tablet is either 2 milligram or 4 milligram tablet. It can be given depending upon the severity of the symptoms and the side effects are similar to oxybutyl. And solifenacin it is available as a 5 to 10 milligram. And here also it can be started as a 5 milligram dosage. Gradually it can be increased to 10 milligram dosage. And all the anticholinergics can be given for a period of 8 to 12 weeks. And then we can stop the drug, reassess the patient, re-evaluate the patient. If needed, it can be started after 2 to 6 weeks interval. And again the side effects include a dry mouth and constipation. And coming to the darifenacin. It has a muscarinic receptor specific action. So, darifenacin has a darifenacin has a highest selectivity for M3 receptors, which is more in the dorsal muscle, and it relatively spans M2 receptor. And improved efficacy with reduction in overactive symptoms. 
but it has no effect on the cognitive function, so it is more important in older women with uh, uh, Parkinsonism and other CNS diseases. And it has no clinically relevant effect on ECG because it did not affect the cardiac function. So it can be given in cardiac patients also. And because of the better tolerability, low incidence of dry mouth and constipation, and daricanacin is most preferred drug in geriatric people. So the dosage is the starting dosage is 7.5 mg daily and it can be gradually increased to 15 mg and for greater symptom relief 15 mg daily is needed. And then trospium is a quaternary amine as opposed to tertiary amine. It is a 20 mg BID dose. It is harder to pass through the blood brain barrier with the less side effect and it is not metabolized by the Mirabogan is the latest drug which selectively targets the beta-3 adrenal receptors. It decreases the abnormal diffusal contraction between the kidney phase, which is the most pathognomonic of this drug. And these studies prove that sample and color these studies prove that the overall, the overall treatment for four weeks can cause more relief to the patient compared to the 12 weeks dosage of the treatment. And now coming to the other invasive methods for treatment of overactive bladder, which is the botulinum toxin. And in August 2011, FDA approved botulinum for treatment of neurogenic diffuse of overactivity. It acts by inhibiting the calcium mediated release of acetyl choline at presynaptic neuromuscular junction, resulting in the flaccid paralysis of the diffuse muscle. 200 to 300 units in neurogenic diffusal overactivity and 100 to 150 units in non-neurogenic diffusal overactivity. Other invasive method is sacral neuromodulation. In 1940 and 41, these studies the bladder contraction followed the activation of the pelvic nerves. So sacral neuromodulation is a unique, fully reversible treatment option for patients with refractive overactive bladder. And correct data proves that 70% of the patients with refractive overactive bladder who receive sacral neuromodulation show improvement in the symptoms. So sacral neuromodulation, although the mechanism of action of sacral neuromodulation is not completely understood, it is accepted that the electrical stimulation of the sacral nerve roots modulate the efferent and afferent neural reflex pathways between the pelvic floor, bladder and urethra, which have a complex interaction between the for the lower urinary tract function in female and maintains the continence. This is the picture which shows the sacral neuromodulation by which the afferent and efferent nerve roots of the sacrum are innervated. And the surgical method is augmentation cell system plus some cases are refracted to medical treatment. So in such cases, the bladder capacity is very much reduced. So the, the option is only to do the augmentation cystoplasty, thereby the bladder capacity is increased, and this is done in severe refractive cases by bypassing the bladder wall and replacing it with a segment of the bubble. In clinical practice, helium is most commonly used as segment of the bubble, but there is no current randomized trials are available in the literature to evaluate the role of augmentation system plastic for management of refractive overactive bladder. So conclusion, overactive bladder is a highly prevalent condition. It affects people of all ages, starting from younger age to the octogenarian group of the women. And because the longevity in female increases global-wise, there is increase in the incidence of pelvic organ collapse and associated overactive bladder and it has a large impact on the patient's quality of life. Focused in history, targeted physical examination followed the appropriate investigations are necessary to evaluate women with urinary incontinence. The first line treatment should include the lifestyle modifications, bladder training, pelvic floor exercise. So I request the audience to instruct your patients to do the lifestyle modification like uh, avoidance of the caffeine and beverages, doing the pelvic floor exercise, maintaining the void in diary, fluid balance, especially stopping the fluid after evening, and mainstay of drug therapy is the anti-muscarinic agent. Third line treatment includes sacral neuromodulation and intravesical botulinum toxin. I thank you.
thank you very much. Thank you, President, Premier and Sandra Shaker, for inviting me. And when they call, I just arrived from Vienna, in which where I have attended as a faculty to a clinical symposium in medical university hospital. When sir called me, just I arrived, and I immediately said I will come and speak on urinary incontinence. I thank the President, Professor Chandra Shaker, for giving me this precious opportunity to speak on Dr. Padma Chandra Shaker Empowerment Corporation. I also thank the HR persons and the audience for kind listening. Thank you very much. Shridhar to please call on the speaker. 